Well, good morning to all once again. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22. And again, another confession is, is the more I studied this the past couple weeks, this should have been split in half uh, when we did a preaching schedule. But the good news is we're not done yet. We come to the end of 1 Thessalonians next week, and obviously we're going to build more on this passage. But this morning, we're going to focus on the church at work. And we live, in a, we live in a tipping culture. We work, we earn money, and you take that money to cafes, to restaurants, in exchange for food and service. And if that service is good for us, we pay a little extra for that money that we earned. The local church is upside down from this. Right? Instead of coming as consumers, we come to church as servants to the master of the house. Right? Instead of greatness coming from being served, greatness comes from being a servant to all. Even our Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took the form of a servant and washed the feet of his disciples. Think on these things this morning as we study the passage the church at work. First Thessalonians 5. 12 through 22, and I'll read, this is the holy word of our God. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, and be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So where the Lord let us pray for his help. Lord, again, what a joy it is to come before your word. What a joy it is to hear your scriptures read aloud. Lord, we ask that by the power of your Spirit, who takes up residence in us, unlock the mysteries of the Scripture, that we might behold Christ, his grace for us in his gospel. Bless us, your people, as you minister to us as we study this word together. In Jesus' name, amen. So in line of eternity, as we've been studying, in light of Jesus' return at at any moment, to right all wrongs and to apply his death-conquering resurrection in the redemption of all creation, which now is now currently groaning for redemption. The church is to encourage one another with this promise that Christ is returning and to build one another up. That's how the previous passage ended. Paul now puts feet to the ground of what it means for a local church to encourage and build one another up as we make this journey heavenward together. Recall what Paul told the Ephesian church. You have been saved by grace through faith. Right? It's a gift from God. So all of salvation is a work of God. It is given as a gift received by faith alone in Jesus alone. Not as a result of works, he says, so that no one may boast. But we are not to end there. For we are his craftsmanship. We are his work. Created in Christ Jesus. So we are in Christ. We have been created in Christ as a church. For what? Good works. What kind of good works? So God, good works that God prepared before time, right? Beforehand, that we should walk in them. So notice the pronoun. It's not just I. This is how we usually are as Americans. We individualize everything. Jesus wants me to be moral. It's we. That we may walk in them together. Right? This is about the church as a community. God prepared good works that the church that is in Christ would walk in them together. What works? Well, first, 
Paul starts with the church leaders. Look with me again at 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. We ask you, brothers, so again, family language, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace with yourselves. Pastors are to labor among the church and over the church. Here's an important one. We'll get to it in a minute. In the Lord. And you can circle that. They're not just like independently wielding the church by their own opinions and their own charisma, but there is an in the Lord. The church at work has pastors who work. They labor. They labor, they lead, they admonish. Those are the three. Again, Paul loves every list of three, and that's where he goes. But this also harkens back to chapter 2. So if you come back to 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, 7 through 8. Paul inserts himself here, right? We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, and here comes the laboring among you, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. This is what Paul means when he says labor. When he says to labor over the church, the pastors or elders at Thessalonica watched Paul labor among the flock and they labor like him. That is what church leadership is supposed to look like. We will follow in his ways. And we don't, in his context, we have 1 Timothy 1 or 1 Timothy 4. Paul warns young Pastor Timothy that in the last days people will depart from the faith for lies. They will go from the sound teachings of Scripture for the teachings of Scripture that is demonic. But instead, uh, Timothy is to teach the church to receive all things with thanksgiving to God, which is made holy by what? The word of God and prayer. The very ministry the apostles were freed up for when there was deacons appointed in Acts. Freed up for what? What is church leadership? The ministry of the word and prayer. The ministry of the word of prayer makes all things holy that the church may rejoice with thanksgiving before God. And Paul continued telling Pastor Timothy, you yourself are to avoid silly things. Avoid silly controversies and myths. But put these things, the word of God, before the brothers. So again, he's not saying like you stand over the church as like extra brother, right? No, no, no. It's like you are a fellow brother in the church and you have the same thing that is in their hands, the word of God. And you open it like I am doing this morning and explaining the text, right? And preaching, making a proclamation of Christ in this text. And you put it before the brothers, So for, again, Paul keeps saying this, the local church is a family. And he says, be trained in the words of the faith and sound doctrine, Timothy. For this we, and here's the underlining if you're in 1 Timothy 4, for this we labor, right? Because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So Pastor Timothy... Command and teach these things. Set them before the brothers. But coming back to 1 Thessalonians, look again in chapter 2, where he ends that one section we have, we're reading about his, his um, leadership in verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our, and here it is again, our labor, our labor and our toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. Then he comes to chapter 3 and verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you. And here's that word again. And our labor, our labor that was in your midst, our labor as a nursing mother who cared with gentleness, would be in vain. Those who labor among you, 
Paul labored and toiled in their midst. Paul labored over them as a servant who had opened the scriptures to them in order to build them up and to encourage them. Just as he didn't want his own labors and struggles to be in vain, Paul doesn't want their pastors to teach and to labor and to lead in vain, but in faith. So Paul tells the church to what ESV renders, the word respect here, I think it's probably more appropriate to remember and appreciate. Right? To remember and appreciate those who labor in your midst and labor over you and admonish you. Appreciate that Christ, the head of the church, has elders who labor among you and admonish you. These ones who are freed up in the ministry of the word of God and prayer, caring for you like a nursing mother, instructing you like a wise father, and they do so gently. Appreciate that. Yet, and this is where I told you before, if you're, if you're one that likes to circle in your Bible, it's in the Lord. In the Lord, laboring over you in the Lord. That is, to take charge as an overseer is only in the Lord, right? This is only possible if pastors teach soundly the word of God. That's the only possibility. So Paul is saying, if it is in the Lord, you know it's in the Lord when they are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, teaching you the word of God. They go beyond that. It's outside the Lord, and it's very dangerous. So the church is led by shepherds who teach the word. So do not hear teaching with a sense of your gut. This is really important because we're Baptists too. We were receiving the word of God, and the authority in the church rests in its members. So that you need to know what the Bible says and not just go by gut feeling. Because I hear it often. Oh, pastor, listen to this this thing, this message, this clip, look at this quick, quick thing that you put on Facebook that's only two sentences long. It seems right. It feels right. No, you need to know your Bible. I, can't, I can come up here and I can help you discern, but it's important that you mature in your discernment. Why? For the sake of the church. Because we're not the only ones laboring. We're about to go into where Paul is telling the whole church to admonish one another and to labor amongst one another. So it's not just like, well, we'll let the pastors do it and we'll just sit here. Whatever they say, obviously it seems right. Don't do that. That's a dangerous thing to put pastors in that kind of position. You know, we're servants. You know, and I'm up here, the only authority and the only strength I have is to open up the Bible that you have and tell you what it says. And you're just like, well, anyone could do that. Well, everyone here should. We should be doing this. We should know our Bibles well. And that is where the church's discernment comes from. As he's like, the living and active book that is before you is God speaking. Do you understand the privilege that you have as a church member? I mean, think of the centuries it took to get this Bible in our language. The centuries it took to free us up that we could print this Bible. I mean, you know how many people lost their lives to bring it, to deliver this to you? Well, what would motivate them? Because they knew the church who knows the word of God well is a strong church. It's a discerning church. Is a church that knows that this is, this is God speaking to us. The God who spoke all things from nothing into existence is the God who has penned down these words. We receive this not as the words of men, as Paul told the church in Thessalonica, but what they really are. These are the words of God. Paul commands the church to not only listen to and respect or appreciate their pastors, but also to hold them in high regard. In fact, he uses the word exceedingly in love. In love. Let the pastors love the church. And let the church love her pastors. The sound doctrine of Christ is that, to love one another. Right? That's, that's good theology right there. What is it Christ told us? Love one another as I have loved you. 
And this brotherly love extends throughout the entire membership of a local church. And this love leads to peace with one another. You notice how that's how that whole section ends? Love your pastors, those who labor among you, those who are in charge over you, you know, hold them in high regard in love as they labor in the Lord in your midst. And then he says, be at peace with one another. Think, think of this in the negative. And this might be helpful to see what Paul is telling this church in Thessalonica. If you have ungentle, in-your-face pastors, how is that going to translate according to this passage? You have a church that refuses peacemaking, right? There's, not a, there's no attempt to reconcile. There's probably a lot of attempt to talk about one another in circles, and there's hostility and all of that. And that's on the backs of the leadership of the church. So when Paul's not saying respect, the, respect your elders no matter what, he's talking about what they do. Or respect them because they're respectable. They labor among you. They're in your midst. They're part of your community. Right? I don't have this really cool tower to climb up to, to speak way over you. I feel really strange being this high talking about you, but I also know this pulpit, it's not mine. This is the housing of the Word of God. Right? So the Word of God is raised, and I'm only up here because of grace. And I humbly tell you, this is a calling. I didn't earn it. I was pulled into it. By God's grace, he helps me to understand what it is to say and to feed his, his flock. You get nourishment, not because of my charisma or anything about me. You get nourished because that is how Christ feeds his sheep, through his word. So respectable pastors who teach soundly with gentleness are respected by a church who is at peace with one another. Now, this isn't superficial peace either where wrongdoings are swept under the rug, and passive-aggressive comments, which is meant to sting one another as they stab each other with sharp words, and they just quickly walk away from it without any kind of understanding of like, well, I just hurt that person, but they deserved it. Right? That passive-aggressiveness Paul is getting at. He says, no, it's not superficial. It's not a, you know, the thing that uh, we, we do as in the flesh, is speaking things under our breath. It's like, I have stinging words, but I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say it under my breath, or I'm going to say it in safe circles to wound their reputation and embarrass them. That's the very sin Paul is addressing. Right? Paul is commanding this and our church to avoid the, all of that, to be at genuine peace. In fact, let love be genuine. The ending phrase here in this whole section is to abstain from all forms of evil, and it puts together this entire litany of forms of evil the church together are to avoid. Remember, this is a letter written to a real local church, and this is what churching is, right? But how do we church? Remember, they're a very young church. How do we do this church thing? This is the outflow of being at peace with one another. That is genuine brotherly love. Well, it comes to verse 14. It says, we urge you. And again, he uses the word brothers. My dear family in Christ, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Well, I was fine to the word all. I want to be pixie choosy about people that I want to get close to. You mean Jesus put me in a church of diversity, a diversity of personalities and all sorts of things, and I'm still commanded to get close to every one of them? Yeah. You know, the labor, however, we see the transition from 12 and 13 to 14. You notice it's the same words. We think, well, that labor is for leadership alone, right? I could just, you know, churching for me is just being there, right? I don't have to actually do anything. He says, pastors lead and admonish, but then verse 14, so does the church, right? Pastors help, encourage with gentleness and patience. Here, the church helps, encourages with gentleness and patience. This continues the theme of practicing brotherly love more and more that Paul is urging them to do. That's coming from the previous chapter. This is brotherly love. 
Right? Brotherly love is the will of God for Thessalonica. The brotherly love and sanctification is the will of God for Allison Avenue Baptist Church. So, dear Christian, by Christ's authority, you are commanded to have a certain attitude and behavior toward other members in this church. And this is in that fanciful word that we Christians use, fellowship. Our fellowship is in the Lord, and this is what it looks like. Regular gathering, getting to know and be known by one another. That's haunting, because I know of my sins, my errors. And then we start knowing each other's. What are we to do with that? In our relationships, Paul has these practical outworkings of this brotherly love we are to have in Christ together when we are this close. But first he uses a word, urge. We urge you, brothers. When you urge someone, they're going beyond their own natural gifting and wants. Right? You urge someone to go against the flow or a little bit stronger than they are naturally at. You're asking me to go a little bit beyond where I want to be, where I am comfortable. We urge you, yes, but as brothers. Right? You are a family together. Again, not only is it this family language, but Paul is emphasizing the church as a physical gathering to express brotherly love. The church of brothers and sisters is far more than proximity. Right? Take it from somebody who grew up in a megachurch. It's far more than proximity. It's like, well, I was at church and I was amongst other Christians. Check. Then Paul's like, no, I got more. That's not all you're supposed to be doing. In fact, there's a whole lot more. You missed out on what churching actually is. So he says, there's this deeper sense when he uses the affectionate term, brothers. It's so much more different than the world's definition of friendship and family, the one that you naturally have. This closeness requires the peace of God to be at peace with one another. Because there's the hint, right? Be at peace with one another. Well, I could define peace in a radically different way from Scripture and say, again, check. Then Paul's like, no, let me tell you what peace actually is. What is peace with one another? Because to do what? Admonish the idol, which idol's okay. It really means unruly, the un, undisciplined, the ones who are not discipled. What do they look like? What did you look like when you first came to the faith? Right? Unruly. Right? He's like, well, I don't know a lot of Bible, but, and that's gotten me in a lot of trouble. You know, I've lived a whole life just going by whatever my flesh says, and now I see the beauty of Christ, but now I'm only taking baby steps, admonish the unruly, the undis- undisciplined, the undiscipled. Well, then you got to get close to them and find out what their life is like. This is not just lazy people, right? We use the word idle, like, oh, well, they're lazy. God is a God of order. And because of that order, he orders his church in such a way that pleases and honors him. So this is like, I have my strength, my sovereignty over my church. I have formed my church in such a way, all of them are to have regenerate hearts. They're born again. I command them to love one another. I tell them what that means, right? But then we are a sloppy mess with that because we're sinners and we're still learning. And so somebody needs to come to me. And admonish me when I am unruly, when I'm out of that order. But he also says, it helps us define the word idle here. Second Thessalonians, says, we're about to go into this in a couple of weeks, but Second Thessalonians 3.11, Paul uses the same word. We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. So he's not saying like, well, they just sit around being lazy. Instead of using their energy to serve the church with humility, they busy themselves into other people's stuff, not to be a help, but to be a gossip, to be a slanderer, to be a judge. Or I would never walk that way. Imagine that. We think that's maturity. 
Oh, I'm such a mature Christian, I would never make a bad decision. And then you come to a, a, a recently born again Christian, and you find out they're a hot mess. You're like, well, I would never, you need to get your life in order. And they walk away, and then they talk about them to other, other circles. That's not helping or encouraging the faint-hearted. That's, that's wounding the weak. And Paul says they're, they're not just sitting around. They're busying themselves, but not in the Lord's work, right? So instead of using their energy to serve others, they serve themselves, right? And they, instead of using their minds to think about how can I serve someone who is weak, they use their minds in selfish ways. Instead of using their lips for encouraging and building up the brotherhood in Christ, they use their lips to tear down, to gossip, to speak negatively. So Paul says, admonish them. Warn them. Warn them of what that is doing. They're hurting the church, hurting themselves. It is disruptive to the order of peace and joy and blessing to be enjoyed with rejoicing always as found in the local church of brothers and sisters. You're being disruptive of that. In this family fellowship of the church, there is a closeness that labors. He says, labor, work. Find someone in your midst undiscipled. What are you to do? Disciple them. You find someone you find is faint hearted. Encourage them. You see someone who's weak in the faith. Help them. Be patient with all of them. And when someone mistreats you, don't repay them with mistreatment, but pay them with good, Paul says. So I ask you, who are you helping? Who you're being discipled by and who are you discipling? Who are you encouraging? Do you only enjoy Christian fellowship up to the point that you like it? Or to the point that you are needed to hear Jesus command you, be patient with them? You only need that command if you're close enough and you are long-suffering enough with other Christians as to say, Lord, remind me again of your command to be patient and gentle with them. We labor together in this, often with a limp, and for, for this world is full of troubles. In Paul's own, own writing, the local church has faint-hearted and weak people in it. What do we do with them? Now, I know what the flesh sees. When they see someone who's faint-hearted and weak, they see blood in the water. The church sees someone to encourage and help. That's the spirit of uh, the Holy Spirit at work in the church. That's brotherly love. But with what in mind? Now, this entire section is talking about we are leading toward Christ's return. Lest we forget why we do this thing. Why do we church? Because we're, we're walking together heavenward. What we think is normal here on earth is actually temporary. And what people think is non-existent, Jesus' rule, is in reality permanent. He's coming back. Strengthen, admonish, encourage, and help one another with this coming permanence of Christ's rule in mind. There are some, there are many folks that are not here because they're with the Lord. Saints, waiting to accompany Jesus in the cloud coming back here. And I bet they are not as worried about finances like I am today. Right? They're, all of the fury of worries and anger and hatred coming out of an election year, all of those commercials are probably not all worried about that stuff. I bet they aren't even listening to it. Their minds and their hearts are too overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory and the power and the light of Jesus Christ. There, my dear faint-hearted brother or sister, if you're weak, dear weak Christian, behold Christ. He is your strength. He is your comfort. When you are faint-hearted and weak, who can you rely on? Christ, and he will never abandon you. Come to verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Guard your heart when you hear this. 
Because you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. The flesh's natural bent is to enforce your own sense of justice into your relationships. Right? So to take revenge or to use the silence treatment, or to gossip and to slander, to mistreat those who mistreat us, and only love those who love us, is natural, something Jesus tells us even sinners do. This goes to being patient and gentle with everyone, to be at peace with everyone, with one another. But not paying wrong for wrong is not the command upon the soul delivered by the power of Jesus Christ. That's how we want to hear it. Right? Well, I just won't pay wrong for wrong. I'll just meander through life, be indifferent toward those who mistreat me. And that is not the command of Christ. He says, always. And again, there's that word. It's going to be really important for the remainder of this passage. Always seek to do good. Seeking to do good to those who treat us well comes easy to the flesh. But Paul says always to who? One another, those who mistreat you. And then everyone that's outside the church, you are to do good to those who mistreat you. Now, patience will be a needed mercy because those who don't always treat you well test your patience, right? I don't know if that is your prayer life. Mine is very raw. When I go to the Lord, so-and-so testing my patience right now. Lord, and if you are a dangerous prayer warrior, what do you ask for? Patience. Where do you think he's going to send us people that we need his patience to suffer well, to do good to? Oh, they mistreat me. I understand that. This is how Christ's peacemaking ministry on earth continues through his church. We need mercy to do this. Peace will be needed mercy because other people aren't always easy and agreeable. God's mercies are needed not just to not pay wrong for wrong. God's mercies, which is rich and free in Christ, is going to be needed when you are freely giving blessings to all, including those who mistreat you. But then, and that flows into 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So again, Paul's list of threes is now comes to the always. The church must do. Rejoice always, church. Pray always, church. Give thanks always, church. This is the word of God. Receive this as his words and not words of men. These commands are to be performed together in Christian fellowship. We need to see the heart of God as beautiful when we hear these commands. When he speaks, it is true as well as precious. When he says that we as a church are always to be doing something, our ears must tune to say, well, this must be important. Yes, it is out of our duty to our God who commands, but also because he only tells us to do that which is lovely. And this is lovely. It brings glory and honor to God to obey this command. When he tells us not to do something, he's commanded us not to travel down the road of ugliness and dishonor and destruction. Now, this is the last section of 1 Thessalonians before we get into the closing lines of the letter to this church. And the major theme is at the end of 18. That's also in chapter 4 as well. This is the will of God for you as a church. First, your sanctification. Now, Rejoice always, pray always, give thanks always. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you as a church. Because we are children of light. That's what a church is. Children of light together in fellowship in a world that is dark. And we live in a world headed toward judgment when Jesus returns. We live in a world, Paul says, claiming peace and security. But judgment is coming. So our purpose, the will of God for us, as a church family, is to be radically different than the world's. So our message is, there is only peace and security in Jesus Christ. And since we enjoy that peace and security in the Lord, major theme here also, we can always rejoice, we can always pray, we can always remain thankful together. And this outflowing also ends with verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Continuing again, 
Paul's love of lists of three, now we have the three negatives. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, and abstain, or as we say where I'm from, do, do not look like you're up to no good. You know, that's, sorry, that's a Kentucky phrase. But you don't, don't have the appearance of this. That the Spirit's fire is understanding the Word of God. Right? So you're talking about fire quenching here. To quench his fire is to claim Christianity without bearing fruit. Right? To go through Christian circles your whole life without bearing fruit. And that fruit is in relationships, right? To love, to be close to, to be loved by to confess sins to, to build one another up, all those one another commands, that is Christianity. That's bearing fruit. And he says, to deny the positive commands to rejoice always, to pray always, to be thankful always, in close fellowship of the church, don't quench the Spirit's fire. Hating prophecies is not just skepticism of mystical things. I, I, we don't have time really to unpack this, but if you have your, if you're writing notes, First Corinthians four three says that no one, uh, or sort of the one who prophesies, speaks to people for their upbuilding and for their encouragement and consolation. This, in context, as Paul is talking about, speaking clearly to the church, prophecies in the Spirit is the sound teaching of the Scripture, what we already have, and it's better than speaking in strange heavenly t- tongues that no one understands. That doesn't build up the church. It, in fact, he kind of does it in a little bit of a snarky sarcasm. If that's where you're heading, but Paul answers the why question. We are to be speaking Scripture clearly to one another because that benefits the church. So he says, do not hate the teachings of Scripture in the church, but be teachable. So do not quench the Spirit and don't hate his prophecies that you find in the Scripture. Quenching the Spirit involves losing joy in the church. Right? So that's in the negative. If the command is rejoice always in the church and you are not joyful in fellowship, then there is something wrong. Right? It's like, well, I don't enjoy this. Well, the command remains. You know, don't quench the Spirit. Don't hate His prophecies. You know, abandoning prayer, especially prayer and fellowship, abandoning and having a loss of gratitude for and in the fellowship of the church, And so I have to come to my position that was clearly marked out in 12 and 13. What is my job as a pastor? To admonish you, to warn you in the Lord Jesus. Take this passage to heart and commit yourself to laboring in this church in a close fellowship as commanded by Christ. To reject this, to hate it, To simply read these commands and then brush them aside. To follow the flesh. To pay wrong for wrong. To deny patience. To deny peace with one another. To deny helping the weak. And to deny encouraging the faint-hearted. Do you not also turn away from he who is patient and peaceful and gentle with you? Long-suffering with you. And helping and encouraging you. And then you say, well, they don't deserve my kindness. You don't deserve his. And yet he remains kind. The Bible studied in fellowship will increase our understanding of sin, but not just others, our own. In our fellowship, we are not surprised by the confession of struggles of sin from others. Instead of keeping a safe distance from one another, we draw close to admonish, encourage, and help one another. And there we need the peace of God to be at peace with one another. The will of God for us as a church family is, in essence, authentic worship. Now, don't worry. I'm not using authentic as the buzzword that goes around Christian circles that too many preachers just kind of abuse. What I mean, in a culture of a veneer made for public consumption and social media, the church doesn't need to fall into that trap. While it is good that we are a fellowship where I am safe to be my true self, I need more than just being safe to be my true self that I may grow in Christ. I need relationships that run deep enough in Christ to encourage me to grow every day. So church, I don't, I don't want to be the Andy that I was yesterday. 
And I, in fact, don't even want to be the Andy that I came in before this service started. I don't want to be that guy anymore. I want to be more like Jesus. And so all this in our fellowship, our teaching, our labor, and our union with the Lord, in the Lord, even the pastors lead in the Lord. The fellowship of Christ's people gathered in the church is as a family, far more than simply being there with each other. We know each other. And we are brothers and sisters. Notice Paul uses this term over and over, not only throughout this entire book, but especially as he closes with this idea of the church fellowship. And notice this, in Christ Jesus. Oh, how beautiful is the church when she is adorned in the pure teaching of the word of God, self-giving pastors laboring in the midst of the flock, self-giving church memberships in the fellowship of peace and gentleness and patience laboring with one another, all while we travel this road together, knowing this path leads us heavenward, home with the returning Lord. Robert Murray Machane defined a Christian as a person who makes it easy for others to believe in God. I'd like to stretch that out toward the church. A healthy church, in obedience to the will of God, makes it easy for people in our community to come and believe in God. What I mean is this, behold, his spirit's power at work in and through us in fellowship as we rejoice and pray with grateful hearts together always. The Christian is humble, ready to be admonished, ready for pastors to push them closer into the life of the local church, that they may mature, that they may rejoice with thanksgiving and prayer with the fellowship of the church. And oh, that painful stripping of our pride by the Holy Spirit is for your good, dear Christian. To be so strong, so at peace, so patient, as to pay a blessing on those who wrong you glorifies Christ who blesses you. For he who did no wrong willingly suffered wrongdoing in obedience to the Father, even to the point of death, a humiliating death on the cross. The cost to following Christ as a disciple is great. The reward, beloved, such joy in these rewards is in the Lord. How delightful it is to be in the Lord. Unlike the world's perishing joys, Jesus' delights are everlasting. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. How he serves us, beloved, with such depth of love, so patiently, so gently. He laid down his life for us. He calls us friends. We who mistreated him, he blessed us. We who are not always agreeable, he remains with us and is still close to us. Christ has more than enough glory for, his, for us to rejoice in the Lord always. We will never run out of reasons to rejoice in the Lord together. This world gives us trouble, and he has given us prayer. We pray always because we are heard. And beloved, what do we do? What, what do we have but to be thankful for Christ always? The Christian always rejoices, always praying, Always being thankful to the Lord is useful in Christ's church to seek those who are weak and faint-hearted, to encourage, to help, how Christ-like such a sweet soul is. And he or she extends that blessing even to non-believers who mistreat them, which is a sweet fragrance of Christ who is with them to the glory of God. Amen.